for me, which is very moving, very moving to to hear him recite this poem in right in the middle of this uh, interrogation room in a, in a jail where I knew people had been tortured and if not killed. Uh, and he sang a song for me. And when he, when he sang, he, he threw his head back and he sang and he was, he was in a very proud way. And it was, it was just one of those, the most moving things that ever happened to me. Uh, every time I heard him mention this, when, this man, he would always, tears would come to his eyes and he would, he would break down at the meaning this song had for him. Tony says, could you give us a sample of the poems you like best? Answer, the following is a poem that I like best. I recite it whenever I feel downhearted. <coughs> Funny, I'm, a, I'm channeling Tony here. I recite it whenever I feel downhearted and it never fails to cheer me up. War, cease, peace, reappear. Let, could I get some water? Let the millions of young trees sprout their leaves and stretch their limbs. Let the barren land turn into bountiful farmland. Let the poisoned crop return to life again. War, cease, the deadly game. Let the frightening slaughter vanish. Let the farmers walk their contented feet to the paddy field. Let the paddy ears drink ecstatically the milk of the dew. War, cease. Let the prisons open their gates. Let the sweet hands stroke gently the young hair. Let the people live in peace and abundance. Let the fresh smile blossom on the young lips. War, cease, and Ben High River. Let the millions of hearts. Let the millions of hearts know the joy. <laughs> know the joy of reunion. <clears throat> let, let everybody visit all our fatherland. Let everybody visit all of our fatherland. Let the North and South enjoy the day of reunification. Well, that's, that's the poem that he... We are here to honor those two men. Welcome and good afternoon and evening to those of you here in the United States, Hawaii, Canada, and Brazil. And to our friends in England, France, the Netherlands, Spain, Japan, Australia, Vietnam, and other countries, we wish you a good Monday. And to all of the over 600 registrations for this event, we are delighted you are here. My name is Terry Province, and I'm with the Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee, which is the sponsor of this webinar. We will tell you more about our organization later this evening. We are here to remember, commemorate, and celebrate one of the most important acts and events in the U.S. anti-war movement to honor and to thank the courageous and dedicated efforts of Dan Ellsberg and Anthony Russo, as well as others who supported and assisted them 50 years ago to make the Pentagon Papers public, 50 years ago. At that time, the world's population was precisely one half of what it is today. Two of the five best picture nominations were the anti-war movie MASH and the World War II film Pacted, which won the Oscar. And the number one song in the US at that time was Carol King's, I Feel the Earth Move Under My Feet. But the most important event that year was the release of the Pentagon Papers exactly 50 years ago this day. Many of you here this evening will remember that day. Others of you born during that time, thus making you generation Xers, will learn more about it this evening and all of us will celebrate. Along with the largest civil disobedience protest on May Day that year, when over 12,000 demonstrators were arrested, and the dramatic return of war medals by Vietnam veterans a few weeks before in April, Dan and Tony did not only blow the whistle in June, what they did quaked the White House, shocked the Pentagon, stymied the State Department, admonished Congress, emboldened the media, and validated the anti-war movement. Along with others who planned tonight's program, and I would especially like to thank Paul Ryder and Steve Ladd, 
I was fortunate to work at the Pentagon Papers Peace Project in 1972 in Los Angeles during the first trial project to jail Dan and Tony. We worked outside the courtroom to interpret the Pentagon Papers and keep a focus on the US war in Indochina before the fall election. Bruce Gilbert was on our staff who went on to produce movies like Nine to Five and China Syndrome. Holly Near, a well-known movement singer was our volunteer receptionist. It was during that time I got to know both Dan and Tony, whom we lost unfortunately in 2008 and who otherwise would be here today with Dan. We have a most incredible panel, which I am certain you will appreciate. I am very sorry to say, however, that just last night, Noam Chomsky informed us of a family emergency and thus could not be here. We wish him and his family well during this time. Before moving ahead, let me welcome you with a few hospitality notes. We will begin by introducing Jay Craven, who will moderate the panel and who will do short introductions of them. But I remind you that more detailed biographies are on our website, vietnampeace.org. After about an hour, we will then move to conversation among the panelists and questions and answers from you, which you are invited to submit and which we will aggregate for the panel to either specific ones or to all of them. But before we do that, we'll have a brief note about the Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee and request your support. We plan to end the webinar end the webinar at about nine o'clock. And please remember afterwards, you'll get an email from us to let you know how to watch the entire webinar on YouTube if you wanna watch it again or share with friends. So let's get started. Jay Craven was very active in the anti-war movement and even a researcher for the Pentagon Papers trial. Today, he is a filmmaker, writer, organizer. He currently lives in Vermont and also teaches at Sarah Lawrence. He is a friend as well as a member of the Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee. Jay will be the moderator for this evening's panel. Jay. Thank you, Terry, and welcome everyone. Um, I was asked to open by just briefly describing what the Pentagon Papers were. We uh, know we have some younger viewers this evening. And so I found a couple days ago, June 9th in the New York Times, an article and I'm just gonna share the first several paragraphs that I think capture the essence. Title of the story was The Secrets and Lies of the Vietnam War Exposed in One Epic Document. With the Pentagon Papers revelations, the US, public, the US public's trust in the government was forever diminished. Brandishing a captured Chinese machine gun, Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara appeared at a televised news conference in the spring of 1965. The United States had just sent its first combat troops to South Vietnam, and the new push, he boasted, was further wearing down the beleaguered Viet Cong. In the past four and a half years, the Viet Cong, the communists, have lost 89,000 men, he said. You can see the heavy drain. That was a lie. From confidential reports, McNamara knew the situation was, quote, bad and deteriorating in the South, quote, the VC have the initiative, the information said, quote, defeatism is gaining among the rural population, somewhat in the cities, and even among the soldiers. Lies like McNamara's were the rule, not the exception, throughout America's involvement in Vietnam. The lies were repeated to the public, to Congress, in closed door hearings, in speeches, and to the press. The real story might have remained unknown if in 1967 McNamara had not commissioned a secret history based on classified documents, which became known <laughs> as the Pentagon Papers. By then, he knew that even with 500,000 US troops in theater, the war was at a stalemate. He created a research, term to, to, a research team to assemble and analyze Defense Department decision-making dating back to 1945. This was either quixotic or arrogant. As Secretary of Defense under Presidents John F. Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson, McNamara was an architect of the war and implicated in the lies that were the bedrock of US policy. 50 years ago today, Dan Ellsberg, who worked on McNamara's research team that assembled the secret history of the decision-making that took us into Vietnam Dan released some 7,000 pages of that material known as the Pentagon Papers. 
Our opening guest on this very special occasion is Daniel Ellsberg. 50 years after the release of the Pentagon Papers, Dan continues to make waves. Just last month, he released a trove of documents that show that the United States was very close in 1958 to using nuclear weapons against China. Dan served as a Marine officer, worked in the Pentagon under Robert McNamara, spent two years working for the State Department in Vietnam under the direction of General Edward Lansdale, also worked at the RAND Corporation during the 1950s as a nuclear weapons policy analyst and returned there in 1967 when he worked on a classified study that produced the Pentagon Papers. Dan, I was looking for a fitting gift for tonight's 50th anniversary. And I know that you're hoping for a new indictment for releasing the China Papers, but the Justice Department wouldn't return my calls. So with that, our congratulations for this historic act on your part that illuminated so many and for so long about the policy of the war in Vietnam. Some have argued that the war in Vietnam, like the Civil War, is a bedrock historical moment that, that can and should be for, forever studied. As an opening question, and I'll, I'll, I may break in a little bit uh, just to sort of refocus and, and ask a couple of other questions, but initially, what surprised you as you gathered the information? What were the chief revelations that changed your view of the war based on the study you were assembling? Let's start there. Uh, that motivated you to act? I'll tell you the first surprise that I had when I was working on the volume, a draft of the volume on the 1961 decision making. And incidentally, uh, my draft was not used in the end. Uh, um, they often uh, did several versions of these things and had them over. And actually, my friend Howard Margolis actually did the final draft using my, the documents that I'd compiled. But one of the things I had found in this study was in a way the most startling thing that we, uh, or the most secret, the most carefully concealed thing that we ever did find. And that was the advice that John F. Kennedy had actually received in 1961 after he had sent his chief military advisor, Maxwell Taylor, who was soon to become chairman of the Joint Chiefs, and Walt Rostow, who later was the national security assistant to LBJ, to, uh, to Vietnam to see what was needed there in the uh, fall of 1969. And Kennedy had announced that he was sending what they had found was necessary and all that was necessary, and that was to go through the Geneva ceiling of about 600 advisors there. This is from the Geneva Conference of 1954. And uh, to break through that ceiling and to go up to several thousand, what became by the, before, by the time Johnson came in, some 12,000 advisors there advising Vietnamese troops. But the question was, in my mind was, why, why had they advised him of that, uh, that that was all that was needed and that that was needed? Uh, when I had been there just a month earlier on a, on a research uh, uh, task force for the Defense Department, and what I had learned in a week of uh, night and day almost reading reports and talking to some of the colonels there who were vice and that advisors would definitely not stop the losing process that was underway under President Ziem, who had no political support, and that possibly American troops would make a difference, but nothing less than that uh, would make a difference. And that otherwise we would, uh, we were on the path that the French had followed exactly. So how could it be that just a month later, Taylor and Rostow came back, I wanted to know, uh, and had told him that advisors were, uh, were enough, enough to do this. It turned out, and this took a long time, I won't go into it, to, to find the documents because they didn't, they weren't in the ordinary files we were dealing with top secret in the Office of, of um, International Security or McNamara's own files. But eventually, I got hold of the actual recommendations, which had been excluded from their official report, which was at the secret level. And their top secret cover said was, advisors won't do this, nothing other than the immediate sending of American combat troops uh, will stem the uh, process of defeat that we're on. And in fact, 
McNamara had endorsed that conclusion, as did Roswell Kilpatrick, the number two man in Defense Department, and all of the Joint Chiefs, and a number of other people in the State Department as well. Almost across the board, everyone had said, only combat troops will give you a chance of avoiding loss or any chance of winning eventually. Kennedy had not gotten out, but he had sent the advisors, which they'd all said were insufficient, and his major uh, decision in total contrast to what he had told and what was continued to be said for years was that uh, he had rejected combat troops. And that left something of a, a paradox, you know, why didn't either get in or get out? And Bobby Kennedy later explained that to me in terms uh, in 67 while I was working on, on the study and that's in my book, Secrets. But anyway, that was a, a major revelation uh, not for the first time, that the public had been totally misled as to what the president believed the prospects were and what was necessary to make process, progress. And uh, in fact, while my wife and I were underground, uh, while Gar Alperwitz was putting out the papers uh, and uh, friend Johnny Kichano was arranging places for us to stay to elude the FBI in June of 1971, we heard Maxwell Taylor on the uh, interviewed about this very period on the TV. And he was still saying, this was now 1971 as, com as compared to uh, 61, 10 years later. And he was still saying, I recommended sending uh, combat troops. Uh, I mean to say construction troops. That was the cover that he'd suggested 10 years earlier. And I was thinking, these people think they have an indefinite license to lie that, that never quits. And I was thinking, gee, Maxwell, who I didn't know, uh, the documents on that are about to come out. You know, you should watch what you say. Mm -hmm. So that, now I already knew that everything we were doing was based on lies. I didn't know that that particular, went back quite that far. The thing that most changed my life really, in my whole interpretation of the war was to realize that the lies went back uh, much longer, much earlier than that, to 45, 46, to the period that we thought of as the French War when I was in Vietnam. And that those were the earliest volumes of the Pentagon Papers, and I left those to last on the assumption that they were the least relevant about what was going on now. That was mistaken, because what I learned there was that, for example, that Rusk's position, which I believe, didn't see anything wrong with when I was in the Pentagon, hearing it both top secret and publicly, was that all that is necessary here is for the Northern troops, the troops from North Vietnam, one of these two neighboring sovereign countries who have invaded South Vietnam, all that is necessary is for them to go home to, uh, to North Vietnam and then the war will be over. Well, all we want is for the aggression to cease. And um, what I, by the way, he, I, I was just reading John McNaughton's, the man I worked for in the Pentagon, he wrote a diary starting after I had left and gone to Vietnam. And I noticed that year, month after month, when he's trying to get out, he says, Rusk is the cork in the bottle. Rusk keeps saying this mantra, if they will only go home. And what these early pages showed was they were home that in the eyes of all Vietnamese, there was one Vietnam. Uh, there was different sections, just as there are in, in our country with somewhat different, uh, slightly different cultures and attitudes toward each other. They, all the Vietnamese regarded themselves as Vietnamese and the constitutions of both North and South started with the notion, there is one Vietnam. And, uh, and actually it was not that all the people in the South wanted communist-led uh, rebel revolutionaries or nationalists to be ruling them. That wasn't necessarily their favorite thing, but they all recognized them as fellow Vietnamese who represented the group that had thrown out the French occupiers and were led by that. So they had a respect and a trust which you know, resulted in a total asymmetry of information on this. They would protect, even if they didn't want to be ruled by communists and sent them to they would not betray communists 
in their neighborhoods and to the American occupiers. And um, I, I've given a, a bottom line there, but the essence of these documents was that uh, we had been from the very beginning knowingly, our leaders knowingly supporting a French effort to reconquer a former colony which had declared independence. And that was a fight against self-determination which could not be legitimate in American eyes. It showed me that all the people in all this period was not a noble cause on our part any more than it was a noble cause for the Japanese or the French who had occupied them. And uh, it was not a noble cause for us that had gone wrong or was uh, unsuccessful. It was an unjust war that we were pursuing. And that meant that everyone who was uh, killed on both sides, civilians and soldiers, were the product of unjustified homicide. And that to me was murder. And murder was a process you didn't just try to end gracefully or cover up or try to forget. It was something you had to resist and stop. And I knew every prospect was it for to continue under Nixon. So I felt it was my duty at that point to do whatever I could to, uh, to stop this murder. Okay, very good. Excellent. Uh going into some detail there and, and picking up a little bit of the drama that appeared to be taking place at that point uh, in the Kennedy administration with, with John F. Kennedy wanting not to send ground troops and with huge pressure to the contrary, that we could go into a lot of detail, but there seems to be a very dramatic subtext here where Kennedy was pushing for neutralization in Laos, there was pushback against it. He was in 1961, the spring of 61, according to the Pentagon Papers, asking for a complete withdrawal plan from the Pentagon. It took more than a year and a lot of foot dragging to get it. So that it seems that there were real uh, oppositional currents taking place. But let's move on a second uh, to the, your decision to release these China papers now, uh, indicating that we were much closer to the possibility of nuclear war with China in 1958 than anybody really knew, including significant historians who've already commented on the, the China papers that you released last month. Now you protected those secrets because you knew them 50 years ago. Let, let us know why did you protect the secrets for these 50 years and why did you decide to reveal them now? If I may say, I don't think we really have time to go into the whole sequence of this history. There were many other times that I tried to put them out and I even did put them out and they simply didn't reach the public. That was before the web, by the way. And, uh, and uh, in fact, I'll just mention something that hasn't come up before. I gave that study to the New York Times uh, 40 years ago in 1981. Uh, to Tom Wicker on the New York Times, and uh, he didn't do anything with it. Why not? I don't know. He's not with us anymore. But that's part of the answer to your question. In any way, um, it was the fact is that now, as of now, of course, it's coming about uh, um, insane discussions and considerations of initiating nuclear war in 1958. Well, that's a long time ago. But as I'm saying, the part of the Pentagon Papers that were top secret and that most influenced me at the time were from 48 and 46 and 45. So the fact that it's 58, uh, in this case, they're just as timely as the Pentagon Papers still are in the sense that uh, if we had the Pentagon Papers of Afghanistan or Iraq, which we do not have, uh, I think if you just change the place names and the, the proper names of the people, you'd be reading the same discussion. Uh, I'll bet there are people fighting in Afghanistan now who were not born when we began killing Afghanistan, Afghanis in, uh, 19, in their uh, 20, 19 or 20, 21. Uh, maybe their fathers fought there. But uh, in other words, in terms of what we've learned or in the sense not enough to avoid uh, wrongful, aggressive wars as in Iraq. Uh, clearly the media hasn't learned how to help us avoid those. The Congress hasn't, hasn't moved up. They haven't done yet in Iraq what they did do on Vietnam. And I see with Liz Holtzman here, with, without the impeachment process that forced Nixon out of office, I believe that war could have gone on as long as Afghanistan, 20 years, or more, it could have been much larger. So there was a case where Congress did do its work and the, and the constitution did suffice. 
right now we're moving toward a situation uh, very complicated in uh, Taiwan, where the, uh, the people in Taiwan have every reason, uh, most of them, uh, not to want to be under the, the political control, uh, tyrannous control in China right now. And at the same time, uh, constitute 97% of them are Han Chinese, uh, a higher percentage than in China itself, I just learned, 92%. Uh, and whereas uh, the current leader of China, like all his predecessors, has his prestige riding on not losing part of China. And virtually all Chinese regard Taiwan as part of one China. Does that sound familiar? Like one Vietnam. Uh, so we've got here a very fraught situation with some people in Taiwan wanting to declare independence for a reason, uh, as good a reason as anybody's ever had, you might say for secession, except that they are facing uh, 100 miles away a superpower that uh, where the leaders think they would lose office if they accepted that declaration of independence. I'll say right away, one thing that's getting on me was when I discovered that there are people in America who are encouraging Taiwan, which has total political autonomy at this point, every uh, aspect of independence except name, except membership fully in the UN. It has a an informal office in the UN, but they don't have a formal office, et cetera. I think for Americans, uh, I could name a number, but the, the, the first one that caught my eye was this smart fool on the New York Times, Tom Friedman, about a month ago saying uh, that we should be prepared to fight, have a war with China over Vietnam, over Taiwan, because it has a large super, uh, semiconductor industry that it makes chips. Um, and I said, what? Uh, is going on here. And then we find others, many pressing. I think that any American who is pressing Biden to encourage or to encourage the uh, leadership in Taiwan to declare independence, which China has described as a casus belli, is irresponsible and reckless and foolish, as was true in 58. And it will lead to the same discussions of the possible need to initiate nuclear war, which should not be a private secret matter as it was in 58. It should be a matter if, if we had a Congress in, to, to a degree we do now in the Senate, uh, uh, I'm sorry, in the, uh, in the House, uh, and to some degree in the Senate, if they can get them back to, uh, thinking in terms of their lost constitutional obligation under Article 1, Section 8 to be the people who decide when we go to war, uh, we will make better decisions on that than we would uh, simply letting the other smart fools in the administration who are not smarter than the people in 1958. And uh, that's a pretty low bar because if you read that still classified material which I put out about a month ago, it's quite appalling. Uh, you, you see these people saying things like, uh, uh, let's use just tactical nuclear weapons like the ones that Trump put on our Trident submarines now, low yield weapons that keep the thing regional as an official under, uh, speak of one of the people I was talking about, one of the uh, officials of the Trump administration, Elbridge, Colby said, now if we use tactical weapons against China, uh, maybe they won't respond. Mm, that's true, you know, maybe they won't yeah. respond. Uh, and maybe rain will fall upwards uh, one of these days. But uh, meanwhile, the, the, their willingness to gamble and to threaten is in the pattern of 30 years in Vietnam of really terrible decision-making in secret by people who otherwise are regarded as mature, responsible people who are being human are capable of crazy, uh, crazy decision-making in order to keep their jobs, their role. That's true in China too. Well, so I think we'll come back to some of this. I wanna to move to Elizabeth Holtzman, but um, so the, the idea that as unbelievable as it may seem, nuclear weapons throughout this entire period have always been on the table and that includes in Vietnam as, as something that could be a practical 
uh, tactic used in these high tension situations, which and you what you're suggesting we still have uh, these at stake, and of course all the discussions around Iran and nuclear uh, nuclear weapons there. But I, I'd like to invite uh, Liz Holtzman to uh, join the conversation. Uh, Liz was a four-time, four-term member of Congress from January 1973 to 19 January 1981. Magna cum laude and Phi Beta Kappa from Radcliffe College, one of 15 women among 500 men in her class at the Harvard Law School. Uh, Ms. Holtzman worked on the staff of New York, John, uh, New York Mayor John Lindsay as comptroller of New York City, first woman to serve as district attorney for Qu Kings County that encompasses Brooklyn. As a member of Congress, Ms. Holtzman sought the deportation of Nazi war criminals and focus specific energies on the Vietnam War, including through the filing of a strenuous legal challenge to the renewed US bombings in Cambodia in 1973 that went all the way to the Supreme Court. So welcome, Liz. When people talk about the impact of the Pentagon Papers, um, that's a, it's, it's a large area to consider, the impact on the press, the impact on the courts, uh, the impact on Congress. Um, Congress did not really act to cut off funding for the war until after the Paris peace agreements were signed and after American troops were in fact already supposed to be home. Uh, and in fact, you voted against the Case Church Amendment to cut off this funding because it didn't go far enough during a time when the United States continued to bomb Cambodia. But I know that you have um, some thoughts about the impact of the Pentagon Papers on the Nixon White House itself, which constitutes a huge impact. Uh, and I wonder if you'd explore some of that. You're, you're mm -hmm. muted, Liz. Sorry, you're muted. Yes. Thank you very much. And thanks to the organizers of the panel. And thanks for having me on a panel with such distinguished guests. Uh, I want to start by saying that we wouldn't be here today without the immense courage of Daniel Ellsberg, and uh, I, I just have to salute him. A lot of us can vote, a lot of us can um, talk, but very few of us have to risk, take the risks that he did to stand up for democracy and uh, for our country. So hats off to him. Um, when I came to Congress in 1973, just took my oath of office, uh, the Pentagon Papers had already been released. I was a strong opponent of the war. Um, to me, the Pentagon Papers simply, uh, there were no revelations to me about the lies, about the uh, absurdity of the war, about the horror of the war. But uh, in Congress, people weren't talking about the Pentagon Papers in 1973, but they were talking about ending ending, ending, ending in every way, the war in Vietnam. I mean, remember in December of 72, Nixon engaged in the Christmas bombing of Hanoi. And I, as a brand new member of the House of Representatives, refused to go to the White House for a reception that he held for, for, for new members of Congress. I would not shake his hand and I never did. Um, another war crime that he committed. Co members of Congress were already feeling pressure from the public. And this is, I think, a really important point for listeners. Pe the public can make a difference to members of Congress. We had a Democratic caucus before the, the, the House um, actually formally met. And there was a member of the House from Georgia who was an elderly man. And I never forget this. He stood up and addressed the Democratic caucus just behind closed doors. Uh, event. And tears were streaming down his face. Why? He said, I had always supported my president on the war in Vietnam. Always, always, always. But the people in my district are opposed to the war. And now I have to oppose it too. And he was crying. He didn't want to do it, but he had to do it. And so if anybody ever says, you can't make a difference by putting pressure on your government. This was one strong example. But to, to um, follow your point through, the fact of the matter is that 
Congress did cut off the war, the money for the bombing of Cambodia, but we had a majority to cut off the money for the bombing of Cambodia, but the president threatened to veto it. And then what that meant was that Congress, which has equal power with the president in the constitution with regard to starting a war, unless it's um, to repel an invasion, was now told you're gonna be not just not the, the tail that wags the dog, you're gonna be the dog that's being wagged by the tail of the president. Because where does it say in the constitution, you need two, you need two thirds vote to stop a war. But that's what Nixon told us. And basically, as a result, there was a compromise and the Cambodian bombing was allowed to continue for several months, three months, I believe, before it ended. Congress also voted to um, for the War Powers Resolution, which was supposed to prevent another Vietnam from happening. Um, and we also had to uh, over, override, and we did, um, Nixon's veto. But if we go to impeachment, I want to mention that briefly. I know you haven't raised it, but I want to mention it because the impeachment of Richard Nixon, people think about the Watergate break-in and they think it's a third-rate burglary. And what does this have to do with Vietnam? What does this have to do with the war? And what does this have to do with Cambodia? It deeply was rooted in the Vietnam War. The, the impetus for the techniques that Nixon used, break-ins, burglaries, surveillance, illegal, illegal government activity, starting from his, with his obsession about the war in Vietnam. And specifically what happened was uh, there was bombing of Cambodia that was released, that was secret. There was an article about it in the New York Times and Nixon was so enraged that he started a whole program of illegal surveillance, wiretapping um, journalists, wiretapping members of the House, of the White House staff. Ultimately, though, there was not even a fig leaf uh, of a national security concern about these wiretaps. They were completely illegal and they ultimately became completely political. That proceeded, that was the root cause, and that was the root method that Nixon used to stop opposition uh, and to stop secrets from being released about the Vietnam War. Uh, when, we, when we moved to the Pentagon Papers, we discovered that Nixon was so obsessed about that that he created a special unit in the White House called the Plumbers. These people broke into Ellsberg's psychiatrist's office. They were given assistance, illegal assistance by the CIA to do that. They were given disguises and their photos were, were developed. But the, um, but the break-in, uh, the break-in utilized the same mechanism that was used in the break-in at the Watergate. The same people were involved, just about the whole cast of characters, G. Gordon Liddy, Howard Hunt, and uh, a number of Cubans who were involved in um, anti-Castro activities. That same group plotted and was involved in the Watergate break-in. Um, the problem is, that, as I see it, is that Congress held Nixon accountable in the sense the House Judiciary Committee voted on a bipartisan basis with almost 40% of the Republicans joining the Democrats to hold Nixon accountable for the break in an Ellsberg psychiatrist's office, for the illegal wiretapping, for uh, audits against people who were opposed to his Vietnam War policies. Uh, to the cover-up, all of the cover-up of the break-in and all of that. Um, but Congress, the Judiciary Committee, never explicitly held Nixon accountable with regard to Vietnam. I drafted a resolution calling for uh, impeachment on the grounds that Nixon concealed from Congress and the American people the bombing of Cambodia so that we couldn't make a democratic decision as to whether to continue with it or to stop it. And the committee rejected that. And so it left a, a kind of bitter taste in my mouth that we have never really fully attacked the problem of a president who's engaged in illegal war making activities in terms of accountability. We didn't do it with Bush. We didn't do it with Nixon. 
And who knows uh, whether this will haunt us in the future. Unfortunately, it may. This will be another good point to take up in the, in the conversation between us because uh, this question of accountability um, becomes huge. Um, I think you've begun to, you know, you touched some very important areas in terms of the impact of the Pentagon Papers that, that actually drove the Nixon administration to illegality on multiple fronts, ultimately became the seeds of Nixon's demise. Uh, but let's let's get back into that. But let's first go to Thank Gar. Uh, I just add one little point yes, to that. One impact of the uh, Pentagon Papers, that, which contributed directly to public attitudes about the impeachment, was that the Pentagon Papers established that the government would lie. And they would lie about matters of war and peace. They would lie about matters of life and death. And if they would do that, if a president would do that, then a president could do that about a break-in. So it set the framework for destroying public faith in uh, a president's integrity and honesty. Again, you know, to, to, to even take that further, you know, did the Pentagon Papers themselves and did these illegal actions suggest, reveal criminality that was never, you know, brought to the, to the fore? And that's, that's, a, that's an interesting question just by itself. And we've seen recent examples of the same thing taking place. Uh, exercise of power as opposed to accountability. Uh, Gar Alperwitz uh, is an American historian, economist, founding fellow at the Institute for Policy Studies, guest scholar at the Brookings Institution, special assistant to the U.S. State Department, uh, was working with Senator, uh, Wisconsin Senator Gaylord Nelson and wrote um, a a draft um, amend amendment to the Tonkin Gulf Resolution in 1965 that would have opposed American escalation uh, as the result of that. He also played a key role in developing Vietnam summer activism uh, from 1966 to 1968, uh, which was uh, aimed at canvassing and teaching around the war in Vietnam. Um, Alperwitz has also written extensively about US nuclear policy uh, and the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And I think uh, Gar played, if, if there were to be a, uh, a movie made of this moment of 50 years ago, uh, Gar would be one of the characters probably in a trench coat and a fedora who uh, A, uh, managed the strategy and um, really inserted himself into the drama of how to release the Pentagon Papers uh, to not only the New York Times, but also the Boston Globe, the Washington Post, the St. Uh, Louis Post-Dispatch, a number of newspapers, thereby extending uh, the media impact of the release. He also provided cover for Dan Ellsberg uh, when he went into hiding as the FBI launched a manhunt for him. So Gar, please take us to the moment. Uh, how did you get involved? What motivated you to take risks? Because in a sense, you became an accomplice in this whole uh, enterprise, and um, maybe just how you saw the impact of what you were able to do at that precise moment 50 years ago as the papers were being released. Well, let me, let me start by saying the uh, it's, it's good to see you all again, and Dan again from cross continent every few, few minutes and every few hours we see each other. Um, I, had been, I had been working in the U.S. Senate uh, in 19, during the time of the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. I was a legislative director to Senator Gaylord Nelson of Wisconsin. And it seemed obvious when the Gulf of Tonkin resolution, which gave a, a authorized US uh, involvement in the war was put forward, it seemed obvious that the, the, the claim that there had been a, an attack by speedboats or Vietnamese, North Vietnamese speedboats on American ships was very, very dubious to say the very least. And so, uh, and, if, and if anything, it was minuscule. And if it were an attack, it probably wasn't an attack. Um, so I drafted an amendment, which the Senator put forward, which said any response that the United States make should be limited and fitting to the scale of the provocation. And since there was almost, there probably was no provocation. The Senate uh, Majority Leader Mansfield at the time, uh, said he, that that was his interpretation for the Senate, the legislative record will show that that is the meaning of the Gulf of Tonkin resolution. Now, had that interpretation actually been followed by the administration, 
almost nothing would have happened. There would not have been a war because there had been almost no attack. Uh, but my my sense of it, I had written a book about the bombing of Hiroshima and was very skeptical of decision making being made in the White House on the basis of claims. And it seemed to me that that this was a, a, a phony claim. Uh, so I was always very dubious about that part of it. So that's the context in which uh, I went forward at the time. I later met Dan quite by accident. I was invited to, to dinner by uh, Dan at, at, when he, he was at MIT. And we met, and uh, I, I, at that point, began to uh, didn't know about the Pentagon Papers, except they just appeared in the New York Times, the, I think, two or three days after our dinner. And I, be, the question was what to do about the rest of the papers, thousands and thousands of pages of the papers. And so um, the, the answer was we organized a group of uh, young students at Harvard and uh, f some faculty members at Harvard and MIT and tried to Dan, I think, wanted to release them all at once to get them on the record as, as, as it would be natural. But we thought maybe we could, having worked in the Senate and worked on public education projects in the Senate, maybe we could release them piece by piece by piece over time, thousands of pages, so that people would get the whole story and also so that we could keep the story going. Uh, I, I was obviously, I had been a high State Department official at that time as well. And uh, after that, and, and had some sense of what was going on in the State Department, and it was time to uh, you know, blow the whistle on, on the lies that were being told. So uh, the, this very small role I played was perhaps when Dan went underground to manage the distribution of the Pentagon Papers over about 10 to 12 weeks of piece by piece distribution of the story. So that was front page story for many, many weeks. Um, it was kind of highlighted in a movie called, I think, The Post, the Washington Post movie a few years ago, that the story would be opened up so people could begin to debate the outrageous nature of decision-making that involves the killing of so many people for uh, lies that were being told to the American public. Uh, and I think that's, that's the, the ongoing story that must be told. The deception that is often comes from people in high places. And Dan saw it from the inside of the Pentagon, I saw it from the inside of the Senate and the inside of the, of the the high upper levels of the State Department, that the misleading nature of some of the things that go on really needs to be challenged much more vigorously than most of us do. So I think the story of the Pentagon Papers is, is a much more ongoing story historically. It's not, it's not just Pentagon and it's not just Vietnam. It's a story that skepticism about the statements made by presidents, secretaries of state, Secretaries of Defense, Joint Chiefs, need to be taken with not a grain of salt, but a mountain of salt. Uh, not, not sometimes I'm, I, I don't want to be over, overly uh, simplifying it. There are very honorable men in many of these offices, but it's also time to be very skeptical when when a, the claim is made that young men should be sent to die and and people in other countries may be bombed. Uh, these are very very dangerous times, and particularly with thermonuclear weapons with us. That, the lesson of Vietnam, uh, v Vietnam, for us, how easily, how easily, this minor. It's questionable whether there was any attack on American ships at all, in the Gulf of Tonkin. The authorization to put thousands of people' uh, lives at risk and to kill fifty-seven thousand Americans and three million maybe American Vietnamese was made on the basis of extremely dubious and probably inaccurate information, which the public had no access to. And that sense of skepticism about decision-making made in high places, uh, as someone as, as Dan and, and I have seen from the inside, uh, is a well-placed skepticism that is, is the lesson of the, of the Vietnam War, besides the horror of the killing and, and the, the deaths and the murders of all these million, million, thousands and thousands of people, 57, 58,000, maybe 3 million. Vietnamese, 58,000 Americans. And that's the tape that I, that I saw. Great, thank you. And it's important to note that you apparently left the State Department discouraged by your work to try to influence policy uh, and came to a conclusion that efforts inside that institution were futile, that, that it was not possible Therefore, uh, you left. And of course, it's an argument given to Edward Snowden and others. Oh, why didn't you just try to change it from the inside? And yep. you, you found that uh, 
pretty much impossible to accomplish. Yes, and in, in, we are to have war movement was beginning and we organized something uh, in, called, called Vietnam Summer, which was based on the Mississippi Freedom Summer, which got thousands and thousands of younger people into, into action as just one small part of the anti-war movement began to bring in younger people at that time. Yeah, very, very important. Uh, I remember myself when it was happening. Uh, Barbara Myers is an independent journalist uh, and the first to really dig into uh, some of the motivations and background of uh, the Pentagon Papers' other protagonist, Tony Russo, who was indicted uh, with Dan uh, for the release of the Pentagon Papers and was part of the whole effort to copy and get them out. Um, Barbara has worked in social justice movements uh, since the 1970s, the Indochina Peace Campaign, where she first met Tony Russo and Dan Ellsberg. She attended the trial, uh, worked mentoring young Rwandans in their quest for higher education. Um, she's also worked in the film business and uh, worked on the recent documentary, The Boys Who Said No, Draft Resistance and the Vietnam War. And so we're looking forward to hearing from Barbara some of her insight and experience with Tony Russo. Thank you, Jay. I, I first just have to say how honored I am to be here and um, to get the opportunity to talk about Tony. And I think Tony would absolutely be honored by our remembrance of him on the 50th anniversary. To open, I'd like to try to interject Tony's voice for a moment. In a foreword he wrote for a Pentagon Papers Digest, Tony explained why he didn't hesitate when Dan asked him to copy the papers. My experience in Vietnam taught me, he said, that America in Vietnam was the opposite of the America I had learned about in history books growing up in, in Virginia. Genocide was not the tradition of Thomas Paine or Patrick Henry. I wanted the American people to, cut, to discover for themselves what I had come to learn in Vietnam. Tony called out the Justice Department for its decision to prosecute the whistleblowers instead of the perpetrators of a criminal war. Richard M. Nixon is the real international outlaw, he said, in sort of typical Tony style. And he said, if we are conspirators, the US Constitution is dead. If we are spies, then the American people are the enemy. If we are thieves, then the government, not the people, owns history. You could say that these few lines sum up Tony's story. He talks about the Constitution, his que Tony's quest in Vietnam, and then with the Pentagon Papers saga, said everything about his ideas about democracy. He talks about the enemy. Tony was sent to Vietnam to get to know the enemy and to figure out what made them tick, which was the research question that Robert McNamara had assigned to the Rand Corporation. What he didn't expect was that as he, as he got to know the enemy, that instead of winning their hearts and minds, which was the, the US goal, that, that they would come to win his. He talks about who owns our history which couldn't be more pertinent today as we look back at the legacy of the Pentagon Papers. And he talks about genocide. These are the central themes we're still grappling with 50 years later. The Pentagon Papers testified to what Dan and Tony had learned through personal experience in Vietnam. They establish, similarly to, to, to things that both Dan, to, what, what Dan, Liz, and Gar have just pointed out, they establish that the US was the aggressor, not North Vietnam and not the Viet Cong, who were fighting to hold on to the rights affirmed by the 1954 Geneva Accords. And they docu document many of the lies and manipulations that kept us involved in Vietnam through successive administrations. The papers don't reveal much about the human consequences of the war, but Dan and Tony understood the importance of what they did reveal the lies, the manipulations, and the key revelation that the US was the aggressor. I'll come back to that, that point in a bit. Not so well known is that Tony had another damning story to reveal in addition to the Pentagon Papers. He accused the influential head 
of the RAND Corporation Intelligence Operation in Saigon, a fellow by the name of Leon Goray, of manipulating data to bolster his pitch for the massive use of air power, for the use of Agent Orange, and for the deliberate generation of refugees. All of these were major elements of US policy, and they also were all directed at civilians. What Tony called the Rand Papers should have been an explosive revelation of deception and criminal war to conduct, sorry, of, of, of criminal war conduct. But the story was ignored by the press and is still barely known. So you might wonder, you know, why does this 50 year old story even matter today? It matters because as Tony put it, Rand lent social scientific legitimacy to criminal war conduct, to war crimes, to crimes against humanity, to ecocide and to genocide. An entire volume of the gravel edition of the Pentagon Papers is devoted to the air war over the North, which had, was conducted with no regard for civilian life and livelihood. But as Noam Chomsky has pointed out, seven to eight times as many bombs were dropped in the South. While there's almost no documentation or discussion of that in the, in the Pentagon Papers, there's voluminous data in all sorts of other sources that attest to the, the, to the destruction wrought in the South, and it is all damning. There is no question that the US, not just routinely, but systematically targeted civilians. US war planners had studied the Chinese example and taking inspiration from Mao Zedong's famous quote, the gorilla must move amongst the people as a fish swims in the sea. They endeavored to drain the sea of people so that the Vietnamese guerrillas couldn't survive. That's what so-called pacification was about. And Leon Gore, Tony's boss, specifically advocated the air war for that purpose. His air war advocacy influenced Westmoreland, McNamara, the president's inner circle, and even President Johnson himself. Describing the air and artillery war, one observer referred to the US inflicting a sea of fire upon the whole nation of Vietnam. It was a Holocaust. Millions of Vietnamese died. Robert McNamara cited 1.2 million civilian deaths, but Gar's figure of 2 million civilian deaths just in Vietnam is probably much more accurate. The knowledge of this Holocaust was personal for Tony. He had seen firsthand the effects of torture on prisoners he had interviewed. And his name had been signed against his will to brand reports that advocated criminal war conduct. I remember the anti-war chant, no more genocide in my name. And I think I can even remember Tony chanting it. And I, I can only imagine that that had terrible personal resonance for him. Tony saw racism and the pervasive dehumanization of the enemy as a root cause. He compared it to the Nazi dehumanization of Jews and to racism in the American South where he had grown up. Still, deep down, Tony had a lot of faith in Americans. He thought that Americans would turn against the war once they appreciated their common humanity with the Vietnamese, which explains his approach to the Pentagon Papers trial. I think Tony had two major objectives. The first was to give the Vietnamese a human face. And that's why he talked about the prisoner who was known as AG-132 in the RAND reports. But it was a, he was, his name we don't have anymore, but he was somebody who, who, Tony, who, was, who affected Tony deeply. And he recited a poem for Tony and sang a song to him. Tony recited his poem in court and he cried when he recited it, just as Dan and Tony cried in the, in the video we saw earlier. His other objective was to switch the tables and put the war on trial by presenting evidence like the testimony of Don Luce, who had discovered the tiger cages on Kansan Island. So let's go back to the discussion of aggression for a second. 
Nuremberg established aggression as the precursor war crime, and they gave it its own name, a crime against peace. The concept was that absent aggression, that peace could prevail, and that the rule of war would take precedence, I mean, sorry, the rule of law, pardon me, would take precedence over the rule of war. So the establishment of the US as the aggressor in Vietnam is, the, is a vital link in the story. We are not gonna own our history until we get that part right. And we're not gonna own our history until the, the US acknowledges the vast array of crimes it committed in Southeast Asia. I think that if Tony was alive today, that he would be linking the struggle for Black Lives Matter to the struggle for truth and reconciliation around the seminal US counterinsurgency effort of the 20th century, Vietnam. Only then might we be able to truthfully say, no more Vietnams. Thank you. And Dan, thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Friends, we're just gonna take a few minutes to tell you a little bit about us so that we don't lose you. And then we'll come back to this very rich and somber discussion among the panelists and also questions which you have submitted. What we're learning tonight and remembering is how the government lies to us about the Vietnam War. And believe it or not, the government and the Pentagon are still lying to us about the Vietnam War. In 2009, the Pentagon received $63 million to conduct a 10-year campaign between 2015 and 2025, the 50-year period of 1965 to the end of the war to uh, 1975, to find all the veterans who fought and rededicate and honor them, thinking that they weren't honored, as well as to rewrite and whitewash the history of the war. It reblames the media and the anti-war movement. It calls My Lai an accident rather than one of over 300 slaughters, as it were. And when we learned this, as it began coming to life in 2014, several anti-war activists, pretty much spearheaded by John McAuliffe, whom you see here, and Tom Hayden, whom we lost in 2016, formed what we call the Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee, which tries to remember what happened during the Vietnam War so that it doesn't happen again. The Pentagon is trying to sort of make the military more attractive to high school and college students where it does most of its promotion. And we have fought back and pushed back with demonstrations at the Pentagon, remembering Me Lai, a conference in Washington, D.C. with about 700 people. And we have four more years to go until 2025, when that's the 50th anniversary on April 30th, 1975, of the end of the war. The Pentagon doesn't want you to know about things like this. This is an anti-personnel weapon that they don't want you to know about, just like they didn't want you to know about the Pentagon. This one was made in Michigan. This is called a pineapple bomb. This is a bomb that when it hits the bottom, the, it opens up like a pineapple. And out of this comes hundreds and hundreds of three quarter inch metal flechettes that are able to penetrate, penetrate Vietnamese bodies. It's not necessarily designed to kill them because it wants them to stay alive so more people have to take care of them. And after they learned that the metal flechettes were detectable by X-ray, they made them out of plastic. The Pentagon doesn't want you to know about this. We still have four more years of trying to tell you about what happened in the war. Already what's been referred to, the Christmas bombing, December 11th to the uh, 28th, I think it was, uh, of, of 1972. We would like to ask you to donate. We still have many more plans and more activities to do between now and April of 2025. You can go to our website, vietnampeace.org. You can donate online. You can also send a check. Even if you think it's $25 or $50 and you don't think that's much, please, that's still plenty of money. We would welcome your gifts and we would very much appreciate your support. Jay, thank you and thank all of you for joining tonight. Let's continue with the discussion. Thanks, Jay. Okay, um, I'm gonna jump a little bit into some of the questions which I think will help to stimulate some of the interaction between the panelists as well. And I also wanna invite any of the panelists independently, if you have in response to where we are, another you know, brief um, you know, comment you'd like to make, uh, just feel free, just raise your hand and, and we'll make that uh, possible. Uh, we also have, um, we actually have a 
person in the audience who actually had an experience of being court-martialed in, during the Vietnam War in 1971. And can, can we bring him on easy, easily to um, share his experience? Uh, Paul from Durango, Colorado um, can share a story about how the Pentagon Papers impacted his experience while in Vietnam. Is John able to bring him up or should I just uh, share the comment? Uh, I'll bring him up, but uh, Jay, this was uh, supposed to happen a little later, so it'll take me a minute. Okay, well then let's let's go to another question. Yeah. Um, yeah, Scott uh, Campbell asks, to what extent were American political leaders misleading themselves as well as the public. Uh, Cold War worry, even hysteria was at its height. Uh, another lie, but also with some basis in reality. Maybe who in the panel would like to address that? Anybody? Uh, by the way, I don't know how to put your hand up here. But I never figured yeah, that out. You can just raise it. <laughs> no, I mean, with, uh, on the screen. Yeah. But anyway. Uh, yes, and the answer is they were self. Yes, humans can deceive themselves to any extent necessary. That's something I learned in the Pentagon. I like to express: anyone can be as dumb as he has to be to keep his job. And so, some of this insanity and stupidity and ignorance and so forth is self-induced and effective, indeed but less than people realize. The amazing thing about the Pentagon Papers and what I'd learned uh, elsewhere was that there was much less self-deception uh, than people supposed. In effect, they were copying a plea. They were saying, well, we didn't know better. That's what McNamara said, actually. We were just ignorant. We didn't know what we were getting into. We didn't know, bullshit. Uh, the truth, what I said earlier about Kennedy, uh, which is a little known point, actually, as I say, was a startling thing for me to discover. You can hardly just, uh, you can hardly uh, conclude that the Kennedy, who faced with unanimous uh, opinion that he should must send combat troops if he's the void of defeat, was inspired by hubris, which is I've been seeing even in the in the recent you know fifty year talk. There's a lot of this ignorance, hubris, and so forth. No, he was told just exactly how bad it was. I thought the best. Uh, the best account, uh, as far as it goes, of what the Pentagon Papers showed was on the second day of the uh, installments. That was Monday, 50 years ago, <clears throat> when after two installments, H.R. Haldeman, Bob Haldeman, known to us here on the panel, but it's Bob, but uh, not perhaps to a lot of the younger readers, was the chief of staff of, the, uh, of Nixon. And he was reporting what he had heard that morning from a man that some of the older, uh, younger ones may know, Donald Rumsfeld, because he was then in the White House and later was Secretary of Defense, who got us into Iraq. And what he says, what, what, Rumsfeld, what Don told us this morning is this, he says to President, out of the gobbledygook comes a very clear thing. You can't trust the government. You can't believe what they say and you can't rely on their judgment. And the implicit infallibility of presidents, which has been an accepted thing in America, is badly hurt by this, because it shows that people do things the president wants to do, even though it's wrong, and the president can be wrong. So when I heard that, I thought, wow, Rumsfeld has always been described as smart, despite getting us into this disastrous war in Iraq. Uh, if he knew that, uh, why 30 years later is he demonstrating each of those points that he had made in 1971? And I think the answer is that uh, an addendum to that list, uh, another one that he could have said is, and people who were doing things that are wrong because the president wants them to do it, will keep his secret indefinitely, like Maxwell Taylor, or that was just described, will keep their mouths shut, even though they think what they're doing is, is very wrong. And uh, you can rely on that. In other words, the addendum is, and you can get away with this. That's why people will do it. They'll keep it shut. They'll lie to the public. They won't tell the truth and so forth. And so every aspect of that is shown in the clear-cut aggression of Iraq, uh, the uh, cakewalk that we were supposed to have, in effect, uh, 30 years later. And um, 
right now, you know, uh, Liz Holtzman was, uh, I'm thinking of this, Liz Holtzman was part of a process. I was very interested, Liz, when you, if I may call you Liz, that uh, were, uh, when you mentioned that you had, I, I didn't remember this, that you had tried to bring an article of impeachment against the lying, deceptive aggression into Cambodia without any congressional approval. And uh, I didn't know that you were the one who had done that, but I did know that Congress rejected that point to get Republican votes on this. And as you said, very, it's been very costly to us, to our constitutional system, that no president has ever been held to account for this. And of course, that goes right up to the president, even after the Dem Democrat and Republican, even after the War Powers Act was uh, put in, uh, it's been ignored by virtually every president since then, including President Obama, who didn't even bother to uh, inform Congress that we were getting into armed conflict because his, his point was, no American lives were at stake, only Libyan. We were using drones and planes. So his counselor, Harold Coe, who had criticized Bush for doing exactly the same thing in Iraq, now that he was counselor on the other side of the fence, he's saying, no, it wasn't armed conflict under our war powers. And uh, so they get away with it. But on this, you were part of this one process where I, I don't know of any previous war in history that had been ended by a parliament uh, legislature cutting off the funding for it, which of course is possible under our constitution, not even possible under others, but we had never done it before and it happened. So then right now, um, the, and, and by the way, uh, as Mort Halpern has pointed out, Nixon would have vetoed that had it not been that he knew he was facing at that point possible impeachment. And he, uh, you may or may not know some of the timing on this. Uh, I, I was close to it in a certain sense. And uh, he, uh, he could have vetoed that. He couldn't have overridden him then probably, except that he knew he had to save every vote and every bit of energy to try to fight impeachment. But uh, now we are participating in a genocidal war in Yemen. And for the second time in human history, as far as I know, or American history, Congress actually voted to cut off the funding for our support to Saudis for their aggression in Yemen, which is, is going on. And Trump vetoed that and they couldn't override the veto. Well, right now, we have a president who presumably would not veto that if we were voted again. So Liz, I wish you were back in Congress, but we do have Bernie Sanders who pushed that fight uh, in, in the Congress and others in, in, uh, in the House as well. And uh, we should be able to get that again. So one lesson of the positive lesson that you can end a war the way the constitution provided for by putting it in the hands of Congress uh, on the spending, could be done again to stop a war in Yemen. And right now, uh, there's some talk, uh, more than talk, of ending a war in Afghanistan, ending the ground troop part of it. But Nixon's plan, his strategy in 73, was to get the troops out, but to return to the bombing. Everything we're hearing now about Biden's plan right now is to continue our supposed right to bomb Afghans indefinitely from outside Afghanistan. So the war will go on uh, maybe 20 years, just the way Nixon planned to do it in Vietnam. And, and you, Liz, and others in Congress prevented that from happening. So there are these both negative and positive lessons here. Simply getting the word out to the public in the Pentagon Papers did not end the war, did not end the war, didn't even contribute directly uh, to it. American opinion was affected to some degree, but they were already against the war and Nixon didn't care about public opinion. He was carrying it on. He had to be out of office. That's where you and your colleagues were essential. And, the, and uh, Alex Butterfield, who reveals the tapes, uh, were, was essential. You know, there, there were 50 to 100 people outside Congress who did what they had to do to be able to end that war, but it did happen and it could happen again. People who understood the moment and acted on it. Uh, yourself right. and, and others. Elizabeth, would you want, Liz, do you want to say something? Yeah, I, I, first of all, I, I, I agree with what uh, 
Dan has said, but I, I also want to add to the explicitly about the question, just dealing with Nixon and what we knew from the tapes and what we knew from the investigation, the impeachment inquiry. Nixon was in charge. He's the one who set up two sets of books about the Cambodia bombing. It wasn't done by some underlings. He wanted to prevent Congress from getting the information. So like any ordinary criminal, he created two sets of books, one for the public, which showed no bombing in Cambodia, and one for the Pentagon and for, the, for people who had to know, which showed the bombing in Cambodia. We know from having looked at the whole Watergate um, mess, uh, tragedy, horror, that Nixon was in charge. He wasn't duped. He wasn't, <laughs> he wasn't, no wool was pulled over his eyes. He was the one who orchestrated everything. And I can't imagine that the other presidents didn't know exactly what they were doing. Partly it may have been political reasons. They didn't want to be the ones to quote unquote lose Vietnam. I don't know what their motive was, but I don't believe any of them had any real illusions that we could win that war. And I think that's the tragedy. So that's really why it's up to the American people and people like Dan who have that courage uh, to blow the whistle and tell the truth. Excellent. We have two people on screen from the audience who have something to offer. Paul Rogers from Colorado. Uh, if you can unmute yourself and share your story, that would be great. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's really an honor to be with all of you. I, I know some of you and it's always good to see you. One of the things that um, Jay said a little earlier was um, there are people who have tried to change the system from within this inside the system. And I just had to chuckle at that one. <laughs> I, um, I was an ROTC kid at Our Lady of the Lakes Catholic School and, uh, and from the period from 66 to 70, which was um, a lot of things happened during that period of time. When I was commissioned, I was stationed on a ship called the Constellation. It was an aircraft carrier in dry dock in Bremerton. And when I showed up on that ship, the, uh, the amount of descent uh, for this young guy showing up on a ship thinking he was gonna be a career Navy man was just overwhelming. There's a group called Concerned Officers Movement that I quickly aligned up with. And as time went on and my duties and the constellation kind of unfolded, I got in a lot of trouble. Um, I invited Jane Fawn on the ship. She came. Um, after that, I got kicked off the ship and I was stationed at the 11th Naval District and they really didn't know what to do with me. So, here I am, this young officer in the 11th Naval District, and I decided at lunch one time to go out to the, uh, to the main pier and have a news conference with David Harrison and uh, another one of my friends, a Navy pilot named John Hyler. We announced that we were gonna have a vote on whether or not the Constellation should sail. Um, when I got back to the 11th Naval District, returned to the lunchroom, the admiral in charge was outraged and I was right behind him and he was yelling and screaming and saying, who the hell was that that did that in Navy uniform out in the 11th Naval District Pier? And I just kind of looked at him and says, that would be me, sir. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, the results of that were pretty predictable in retrospect. I was, um, assigned to a tribunal where three people, three officers were gonna decide what to court martial me on. And um, it didn't go exactly the way they planned because one of the people on the tribunal was a medical doctor from Balboa. And this was in 1971. And he inadvertently introduced the idea that, well, wait a minute, why are we mad at this guy? I mean, why are we mad at him? What about the Pentagon Papers? He introduced that concept to this tribunal. <laughs> and the other two guys, one of them was a Mustang and the other one was a chief warrant officer just about died. Um, you know, as time went on, I was, they didn't know what to do with me. And uh, we continued to work on the vote 
the constellation uh, if you saw the indoctrination into the you know that Carnegie thing that they had with Joan Baez uh, getting some sort of reward at Carnegie one of the pictures she had was her in a t-shirt that said Connie stay home for peace and during that whole summer um, I think uh, the higher ups in the Navy just said the best thing to do with this guy and his Pentagon paper defense is to get rid of him. So they essentially fired me under honorable conditions. Uh, the other guys that I did that work with, uh, we call ourselves the Peace Boys. We've been lifelong friends. Uh, we do a lot of peace work together. Um, and you know what? I have Daniel Ellsberg to thank for my life being the way it is. So. All right. I am so grateful to you and to this panel. So thank you so much for letting me talk and share that. Thank, Bye -bye. thank you, Paul. That's a fabulous story. Absolutely. And, and for, for also understanding the moment and taking action yourself. Sam Brown is here, who was coordinator of the 1969 moratorium. Uh, huge demonstrations that really uh, were historic and influential. And we, if we had another half hour, we could go into that. But uh, demonstrations that had a huge impact in limiting options that Nixon was considering for escalating the war in late 69, early 1970, possibly including the use of nuclear weapons, as Dan has pointed out in a variety of situations. But anyway, Sam, please. Hey, thank you, Jay. And uh, it's nice to see a bunch of old friends on here. Um, I just want to make a couple of comments. One is, you know, prior to the release of the Pentagon Papers, the anti-war movement, we were always on sort of fragile ground. We thought we knew what we were talking about. We were making a case for what we were, knew we, what we were talking about, but we didn't really know for certain. There was always the chance that we would be wrong and, that, and discredited as a result of that. Uh, I think Dan, in, by 1969, uh, thanks to you directly and indirectly, we pretty much knew we were on solid ground, but the Pentagon Papers really uh, turned the corner in terms of the credibility of the anti-war movement. And Dan, you earlier said, well, you weren't sure how much it mattered and maybe it didn't and it didn't end the war. And no, it didn't end the war. It went on for another four years after that. But there's no question the Pentagon Papers changed the dialogue about who had the high ground in term, not the moral high ground, which we always thought we had, maybe a little too much we thought we had sometimes the moral high ground, but it changed the dialogue about what was real and what was not. And that was a huge difference in shifting public opinion. So. Dan, don't for a moment think that what you did and Tony did and, uh, and Gar did didn't shift that dialogue in an important way. I also want to make a, a very brief comment that there's a recent book out called The Insanity Defense, which is a book about uh, U.S. foreign policy, which essentially argues that the, based on that old saw that um, if you keep doing the same thing and getting the same result, uh, it, and expecting a different result, it's the very definition of insanity. Mm -hmm. And that, it seems to me, pretty much describes our, uh, much of our, uh, the militarization of our foreign policy, that we keep doing the same thing over and over again and thinking we're going to get a different consequence, but Iraq, Afghanistan, wherever it is, we get pretty much the same consequence. And there's an obligation uh, that falls on those of us who are older and have been around this before to not allow ourselves to fall into any kind of complacency, but to keep up the struggle. And I really appreciate the people on this call who have spent their lives making this struggle uh, for a more decent, humane uh, foreign policy um, and a part of their lives. So thanks to those of you on this call. We really, it's really great. Thank you, Sam. Um, we're pretty close to nine o'clock. I'd like to ask any of the panelists if they have another comment they would like to offer in, in parting. Uh, we talked a little bit earlier about impact of the release of the Pentagon Papers. 
Um, we talked about accountability. Uh, those are two points I might just briefly touch on, but uh, anybody that has some additional thoughts. I mean, Dan, you mentioned earlier, wondering about the impact and you probably know, and I have something I brought up in our May Day com uh, conversation a little bit earlier, but the, you know, Ted Schultz's history of the secret talks between uh, Le Ducteau and Kissinger in Paris show that just after May Day, in fact, Nixon abandoned his long held position that he would not set a date for withdrawal of American troops. And then in August of 71, after the release of the Pentagon Papers, the United States made two more substantial concessions saying that number one, they would pay reparations to North Vietnam for damage done by the war, and that they also uh, would no longer require the uh, removal of North Vietnamese troops in South Vietnam. So I think that that spring, which included Dewey Canyon three, May Day and the release of the Pentagon Papers, in fact, did have some specific impact in moving the negotiating position of the United States uh, in substantial ways that were very important for the way those negotiations played out over the next couple of years. But anyway, other comments, I would love to entertain anyone that has something further to say. Dan, go ahead. Okay, uh, on a couple of people here I see on the screen. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, Gar made the point that um, and, and quite rightly that he was the one who thought up the idea of putting them out sequentially. And uh, had that not been done, I think the Supreme Court might well have gone in a different direction. So that was, uh, and, and we would have gotten, we could have gotten prior restraint had they been able to stop it with the, say, the Times and the Post alone. Uh, I want to especially comment though on, uh, on Sam Brown. I was so happy to see him here. I've often given uh, the example, the Pentagon Papers did not have, as Sam pointed out, an immediate effect for sure. The next year, a year later, was the heaviest bombing of the war. Uh, a year and a half later in the Christmas bombing was the heaviest bombing in human history for 11 days over a period. So, uh, however, I've often given as an example from what we now know uh, of something that had an immediate enormous effect. And that was that what you called a J, a demonstration, was actually a general strike. And they chose not to call it that. It was a weekday demonstration where people took off from school and from, but especially from their work. And um, uh, during, the, during the week and took the day off, that was a strike. And the idea was the next month there would be two days and then three days and so forth. And they chose to call it a moratorium because general strike sounded too provocative and too radical. But as the Pentagon Papers were not out then, uh, <clears throat> so they had no effect on that. I was copying them at that very time. But um, what we didn't know then, and what Sam didn't know, and I didn't know, and uh, was that Nixon was actually threatening to initiate a major escalation of the war, including definitely targets that had been chosen for tactical nuclear weapons with a small number of civilian casualties near the Chinese border. Um, targets had been chosen for them as Roger Morris uh, working for Kissinger actually saw those. And the reason that wasn't carried out in November 3rd, which is after the October 15th strike moratorium and before the November 15th moratorium was solely because Sam and Dave Hawk and uh, uh, Mixner and uh, Marge Sklinker as organizers put 2 million people in the streets uh, around the country for on one day at the same time. So they were all added up 10 here, 15 there, 10,000 here and so forth. And they added up to 2 million. And it was impossible for Nixon to carry out plans for which the Strategic Air Command was on secret alert at that point to initiate nuclear war. So he prolonged the moratorium on actual nuclear attacks, not on threats, but on attacks by another 50 years and more. So that was an example of an action that, of immense uh, effect, immediate effect that people didn't even know at the time uh, had, and for many years later, had taken place. And finally, if I can say, uh, Jay, looking at you, uh, the, uh, we may have met in between, I don't remember, but the last time I remember seeing you was, as I mentioned, just before May Day, when you were speaking for BU at a, at a rally at Brandeis. And uh, it so happened that we'd formed an, an, an affinity group uh, at MIT with very uh, impressive people in retrospect, uh, Noam Chomsky and Fred Brentman and 
Mitch, Mitch from about six or seven people, Marilyn Young, and uh, as to what to do in various actions. And uh, somebody had been nominated to go to, to May Day, to Washington, to scout out May Day, because there was talk there was going to be mobile actions and maybe burning and cars burning and trashing and this and that. And we weren't sure we wanted to be part of that. So um, somebody, one of the group went down to, to scout it out a bit, I forget exactly how they, how they made it up, but we hadn't decided to go. And uh, then I went, to, I spoke at Brandeis. And I'll just, it so happened that in the course of speaking, I heard your very eloquent speech, that was impressive, and other people, and I got carried away a little bit. And I said, um, let's see, what day was May Day? Was it a- uh, Monday. Was it a Saturday? Monday. What was it, Monday? Monday. Monday. Monday? Yeah, okay. Another weekday. Yeah. So uh, just stop the war. The idea was to, if they won't stop the war, we'll stop traffic, we'll stop the government. So uh, I went off to this, this, this talk, not having decided to go to May, none of us had, and heard you and heard the others. And so when I spoke to this crowd that was, you know, in the aisles, it was breaking the fire regulations, it was just an enormous number of people. And I was caught up in it. And I said, you know, how many people here have seen the movie Little Big Man, which had just come out with Dustin Hoffman, about a uh, hundred year old uh, Indian who had been in various massacres and whatnot. And um, uh, they'd all seen it, everybody had seen it. So I said, well, remember the line in that movie that keeps coming up whenever the battle is facing? Come brothers, this is a good day to die. I said, now it's never really a good day to die but it seems to me that coming Monday on May 1st is a good day to get arrested in Washington. There and I go. came, wait, I came back and told Patricia, well, it turns out I'm going to Washington. <laughs> if I hadn't said that, it wasn't clear at all. We, we would have gone, but we all turned up. And now you're telling me, are you, that this crucial decision by Nixon that he was willing to take all the troops out, which I knew was made in the spring of 1971, very crucial. That's right. Uh, I had not associated with May Day or with, you know, the people throwing their medals, the, uh, the troops right. there and so forth. Dewey Canyon. I really want to look into that. You really some, that's very interesting. Yeah. It may well have had that effect. Anyway, thank then, you, Jay. Well, thank you. And then in August, further, further concessions were made after the Pentagon Papers. Liz. Just want to make a point. Dan Ellsberg didn't go to prison because his case was dismissed because the judge, because of all of Nixon's evils and all the break-in, and Nixon, that, the, the break-in into Daniel Ellsberg's psychiatrist's office was one of the grounds for Nixon's impeachment, just letting people know. So right. who got to pay the price? Glad to hear it. <laughs> all connected, all connected. Well, we could go on longer, and I, I, you know, but I think that this has been a fabulous opportunity to share some thoughts, to dig into the history, um, think about the current situation that we face in American foreign and military policy, and to really pause and thank Dan Ellsberg for taking the step that he did for understanding the historic moment that he did to have risked 115 years of imprisonment. Maybe you'd be out on good behavior by now, Dan, but, uh, and now he's asking publicly to be indicted again for the China papers. So, uh, that, if nothing else, gives us hope for the future, uh, the, the continuity of resistance uh, and, and of acting on an idea, on acting um, uh, based on a courage uh, that and also we are all connected. And I think that you bring that together very nicely tonight. Thank you for that tribute. And I have to say, I'm looking at a screen full of people here that are non-people, each one of which put the highest priority on doing everything they could to end that war, of which there were, as, you, as we all know, thousands and thousands of people, 5,000 young Americans went to prison to send the strongest possible message. 50,000 risked imprisonment in that. I don't know any other country like that. Well, I'm very happy to get these tributes and Patricia and I are very aware that we were one link in a chain of events that did in fact contribute to shortening the war. And there was, uh, you know, at least 50 to 100 people whose actions were essential. I'm looking at several of them here on this screen and hundreds of thousands of others who did what they could 
unlike every member of the government, not one of whom risked their career, not one showed the moral courage to risk their career to do what they could have done to enlighten the public and to resist that policy. So uh, we, we have to change the standards for what we demand of our, uh, of our officials and our representatives, but you can't do better than to follow the standards of the people, the other people on this screen. So I thank you all. All right. So Dan, I want to. I we also. I also want to salute you. And, and if you uh, are indicted for the the China Papers, we will have another webinar with you. And so this will go on and on and on, and it'll continue. And to all of you who have been listening, we thank you for your positive comments and support. You'll get an email from us to let you know when to be able to see this on YouTube and share with your friends and please distribute it. Jay, I want to thank you for moderating. Barbara, Gar, Liz, Dan, it was wonderful to have you together. John, for your thanks. We have more programs in the future, so there will be more discussions. We wish you all a pleasant evening wherever you are in the morning or at night. Take really good care, and we look forward to keeping in touch. Thank you very yeah. much. Before you sign off, if you did not see the poetry at the beginning, um, I will try and pull it up again on the share screen and you will be able to see it. Um, this is Dan and Tony Russo, and it's, it's worth, it. even if it's the second time, you should see it. Um, uh, in addition to putting up on YouTube the, uh, this whole program, we will make the Q&A and the chat available through the page where you saw the biographies and the program, but that'll be in the note that, that we send to everybody. So yeah, there um, are fabulous comments on the Q and A and on the chat. Yeah, I'd like to, great to go through all of them, but really wonderful, thoughtful, very important comments there. And just one more thing, Democracy Now contacted us during the webinar. It's featuring a program later this week with Dan and they wanted to use this entire webinar as well. So Check out the no, they didn't say they want to use the whole webinar, Terry. They'll use some of it. Oh, well, I, I beg your pardon. <laughs> they have a whole program to do. Uh, but And I think it's actually tomorrow, um, Good. Which, which means I'm going to rush to put it up on YouTube so they can access Excellent. whatever they want. And, and again, everybody will get a note about that. So finally, um, I wanted to thank Terry for his role in making this particular program happen. VPCC is uh, six, seven, eight, ten people who have been working and is always looking for more people who want to work on, on trying to, as Terry said earlier, trying to preserve, capture, draw the lessons from the experience of the anti-war movement. And uh, Terry's been an important contributor to that process. And in in particular for this program. So thank you from my view as the overall coordinator of VPCC and the, your technician for this program who got it maybe 85% right. <laughs> Great, thank you. So I will try now to put this up and then we'll just where, close where were, that. Where were these from, John? Do you have that? Dan, it's from Tony's memorial, and then and Tony's oh. interview um, for Hearts and Minds. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, I've never seen and it. people should not talk now because it's going to be uh... several of the interviews were very moving, and one interview in particular, and I look back now. Uh, as being a real turning point in my life, actually. He recited a poem for me, which is very moving, very moving to, to hear him recite this poem in, right in the middle of this uh, interrogation room in a, in a jail where I knew people had been tortured and if not killed. Uh, and he sang a song for me. And when, it, when he sang, he, he threw his head back and he sang and he was, he was in a very proud way. And it was, it was just one of those, the most moving things that ever happened to me. Uh, every time I heard him mention this, when, this man, he would always, tears would come to his eyes and he would, 
he would break down at the meaning this song had for him. Tony says, could you give us a sample of the poems you like best? Answer, the following is a poem that I like best. I recite it whenever I feel downhearted. <coughs> Funny, I'm, a, I'm channeling Tony here. I recite it whenever I feel downhearted and it never fails to cheer me up. War cease, peace reappear. Let, could I get some water? Let the millions of young trees sprout their leaves and stretch their limbs. Let the barren land turn into bountiful farmland. Let the poisoned crop return to life again. War cease, the deadly game. Let the frightening slaughter vanish. Let the farmers walk their contented feet to the paddy field. Let the paddy ears drink ecstatically the milk of the dew. War cease. Let the prisons open their gates. Let the sweet hands stroke gently the young hair. Let the people live in peace and abundance. Let the fresh smile blossom on the young lips. War cease and Benhai River let the millions of hearts. Let the millions of hearts know the joy. <coughs> know the joy of reunion. <clears throat> let let everybody visit all our fatherland. Let everybody visit all of our fatherland. Let the North and South enjoy the day of reunification. Well, that's, that's the poem that he heard from this guy in prison. Then he, then he went on to sing a song, and he, he threw his head back and he sang out, sitting there in the middle of this prison. That was the, the stark, the stark contradiction of the whole thing because, because the Vietnamese people are very, very beautiful people, you see. And what the United States is doing to them is, is as bad as they are beautiful. Okay, thank you very much to everyone. Um, we still had 237 people with us at this point. So again, I should thank Jay for moderating one of our best programs, as well as all of the speakers and most especially for Dan, who uh, we can't give too many tributes to in course of this anniversary and happily the rest of the world seems to be recognizing that too. So take care. See you at our next program.